This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. For more audiobooks and other content, please visit reconstructionistradio.com. Book title, Church Shift. Author, Sunday at Elijah. Published by Charisma House. Copyright, 2008. Narrated by Jason Garwood. Dedication. For my grandmother, Mrs. Rachel Adelijah, who picked me up when my mother and father had forsaken me and trained me into a man of virtue. Preface. A word from the author. In November 2006, I wedged myself between the armrests of an airline seat and settled in for the long flight back from Kiev from one of my numerous trips overseas. Without much room to maneuver, I just leaned my head back to pray. My prayers soon turned into meditations about where I'd just been, where I was going, and the overall state of the church worldwide. Suddenly, an image of the globe came to my mind. I could sense the burden God has for His church to be reformed in order to be capable of gathering in the last harvest. From that vision, I came to understand that God is not satisfied with the state of the modern church. Most leaders I have met worldwide would agree that we collectively have a great deal of work left to do, regardless of the great strides we have made. With five billion people still unsaved, we must gain ground. What struck me is that if we are to see Jesus come back any time soon, the church must be reformed once again. What humbled me, though, was the impression that God was challenging me to do something about it. This was in direct conflict with where I was in my comfort zone of ministry at that time. The challenge to play a role in the restoration of the church reminded me of a time of prayer I had in the spring of 2004. At that time, God challenged me to take responsibility for Ukraine. That experience led to the events of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which I thought was the ultimate. Now I was sensing that the victories in Ukraine had only been a preparation for this new challenge. As I prayed about the vision over the next few months, I received clear direction on my role in this latest reformation. My first duty that became abundantly clear was that I should write a book that addresses areas where the church must have a shift to leave the old and bring in the new. The result is what you are holding in your hand now, church shift. May the Lord God of heaven use this humble work to help touch and transform his church. I pray that the little lessons I've been taught behind the Iron Curtain of Communism will be a blessing to the wider body of Christ. It was the missionaries and their supporters, Bible providers, intercessors, charity workers, smugglers, and martyrs sent by the West who reached my family for Christ, provided water to my village in Nigeria, then gave me materials and needed support while I struggled in my Christian walk behind the Iron Curtain. It is God's perfect plan of sowing and reaping that he would now send me to return the benefits of all he taught me while under their care. My prayer is that every church leader, pastor, or bishop will read this book and use its workbook to make a study in home groups, cells, small groups, home churches, Sunday schools, and Bible colleges. May the lessons inside this book not be lost, but bring us all to shift to help gather in the last harvest. Let the revolution begin. Pastor Sunday. Prologue. My adopted home country of Ukraine became the center of world attention in the fall of 2004. In one of the most joyous and peaceful revolutions the world has ever seen, the people cast off the yoke of political oppression that had rested on our necks ever since the Soviet Union made Ukraine a vassal state half a century earlier. Though communism was gone now, a Moscow-backed, hard-line government was trying to steal Ukraine's presidential election and keep the country under the thumb of Russia. The democratic process was being subverted by leaders who had no respect for liberty or the rule of law. The people of Ukraine were headed again towards servitude. But this time was different. This time the people of Ukraine rose up and said, Enough! Not only that, but also God put the church I pastor, the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God for All Nations, on the front lines of an amazing national transformation. Our church played a leading role in toppling the corrupt powers and ushering in a new era of freedom for our country. People were amazed to hear that there is a megachurch like ours in such a dark place as Europe. With 25,000 members, The Embassy of God is one of the largest churches on the European continent and in the world. 
People did not think such a thing was possible, but God has done it. The church and I have been the subject of much media attention, including a front-page article in the Wall Street Journal and profiles in the Washington Post, the BBC, and much, much more. But people are even more surprised to hear that I, a native Nigerian, pastor this church, which is 99.9% white. They wonder how a black man like me ended up in Ukraine and why I was ever accepted as a spiritual leader. But God has placed me here to do something unique and revolutionary. He plucked me from my small village in Africa where I was motherless, fatherless, and so poor that I could barely afford shoes until I was 12, and he educated me under the communist state during the Cold War. Then he brought me, by divine call, to Ukraine and told me to start a church in Kiev, pronounced Kiev, in 1994. Since then, God has done much more than anyone could ever expect it. He has brought a shift in our individual lives, in our city, and in our nation. These principles, I believe, are to be embraced by people everywhere, including you. The revolution in Ukraine did not begin in the halls of power or political back rooms. It began in the prayer closet. It began when our church discovered how to shift society as individuals and as a body of believers. As I looked out on the vast crowds that filled Independence Square during the revolution, I knew that God used our church as a spiritual icebreaker six months earlier when we had held an unprecedented protest at this very spot. Under God's direction, we had been used to change the mindset of an entire country. Hope had risen in a proud nation that for too long had been ruled by unjust slave masters. I believe that the protests and prayers by our church and other churches led to the most important change in Ukraine in centuries. It was a dramatic demonstration that God intends for all believers to occupy their personal promised land and that our combined efforts to follow kingdom principles can transform entire nations. That is the message of this book. God has a plan to help you find your promised land and teach you how to fully occupy it. God's intention is to transform your life your promised land, and your nation, and to use you to bring back the earth to himself, just as he is doing with us in Ukraine. As believers, our first calling is to be part of this master plan. National transformation is at the heart of the Great Commission. It is the primary calling of everyone who follows Christ. This book will redefine your life by redefining what the Great Commission means for you. You will see your earthly assignment in a new way and receive the tools and strategies to carry out your calling with greater effectiveness than ever before. The principles you learn in these pages will help you to establish the kingdom of God in your everyday life and in your nation by applying kingdom principles that dethrone the kingdom of darkness. Best of all, this book is based on real experiences, not theories. This is not my wishful thinking, but rather present-day reality. I believe God chose to demonstrate these kingdom principles in spiritually desolate Europe to prove that any person can find his or her promised land and impact the people in society where God has placed him or her. I now bring those principles to you. You too can find your promised land and bring the kingdom of God right where you live, work, and play. You too can transform your nation for Christ by taking simple steps in your everyday life to establish His rule and invite His glory. One day, the church and its people worldwide will no longer be humiliated and downtrodden, but will lead nations. We will be at the head, not the tail. We will pioneer social answers instead of always playing catch-up. I pray this book and its message will usher in a revolution in your life and your nation that is bigger than any revolution the world has yet seen. Brother, sister, get ready to shift. Chapter 1. People Power I could not believe what God was telling me to do. I kept pacing the floor in my place of prayer where I had determined to spend a week alone with God, and I kept resisting Him. But Lord, what you're telling me to do is unsanctioned and dangerous, I said. We could be shot. The government might bring their tanks out. People might be killed. At the very least, our reputation in Ukraine could be ruined. But God was not budging. During that entire week I spent in prayer, his answer to me remained the same. He wanted my church to openly protest against our government in Kiev. In my mind, this was not just foolish, it was dangerous. It was like declaring war on the government. 
we could be treated harshly, jailed, or shot, as had happened to protesters in the past. Even though Ukraine was not officially communist anymore, the people of the nation still lived under a mindset of oppression. For many years, the Soviet Union had taught the Ukrainian people to unquestionably submit to their authority. Though the Soviet Union was gone, people still couldn't imagine a government that respected them. So the government felt free to treat people as sheep and servants. There was no accountability in the leadership as there is in a democracy. Leaders were as corrupt as they wanted to be, and the people simply accepted it as the way things would always be. They continued to hide their thoughts and feelings deep down inside and pretended to agree with the government. Even though Ukraine had become independent more than a decade earlier, people still feared that the persecutions and concentration camps of the Soviet era would somehow return. As a result, there were no protests and few peaceful gatherings in Ukraine. People did not want to provoke the government. They were fatalistic. The country was frozen in place. Nobody dared step out of line. The underlying threat of violence or hardship against anyone who promoted what the government deemed social upheaval was well understood. Groups that gathered without government approval could be met with bullets and tanks, prison terms, harassment, or at least the scorn of the country. It was one thing for a political group to protest, but it was an entirely different thing for a church to bring out its people in a mass protest. For us, a church already viewed with suspicion by many Ukrainians, any hint of civil disobedience was very risky. Pastoring an evangelical church in Ukraine and other Eastern European countries is a delicate tightrope walk between a hostile culture, suspicious government leaders, a highly educated atheist elite, and unjust laws that keep your church disenfranchised. Ukraine prizes itself on its educational system, all atheist-based, that has produced 14 Nobel Prize winners. As the motherland of the Orthodox Church, Ukraine people are conditioned to believe that the Orthodox Church is the only true church, an emblem of their culture more than a place to worship God, and that other churches are cults, foreign interlopers, even cover organizations for spies. We had fought that impression for years by working peacefully in Ukraine and serving the people. We started a soup kitchen that fed 2,000 people daily, more than a million people overall. We raised up businessmen in the church through our business training programs. We held marriage preparation courses, counseling for unwed mothers, and men's conferences that helped to create strong families and a more stable society. We worked in AIDS prevention and drug rehabilitation, helping 3,000 people to become free from addictions. We were curing many of society's ills without a penny of government money. We were doing the work of God without posing a threat to anyone. We were serving Ukraine in love. But our country still treated us with suspicion and made laws to constrain us. In fact, we were facing a crisis at the moment because, as a cult, we were told, we were not allowed to buy land, even though ours was the largest evangelical church in all of Europe. Imagine having a church of thousands and being barred from building your own sanctuary. That was our situation, and it continues to be the situation for many or most evangelical churches in the former Soviet Union. The Orthodox Church and its allies in the government had painted us as an army of zombies and accused me of being a charismatic leader who kept the church members hypnotized. Never mind that the Embassy of God fed more people than the city government of Kiev, and that all our efforts were making the country more stable and prosperous. We were still labeled a threat to Ukraine's national identity. We had avoided direct confrontation with the government for a decade, but then our building lease came up for renewal, and the government decided to kick us out so they could renovate the property. We had nowhere else to go. No place was large enough. Bulldozers were parked outside our current facility waiting to move in. Soon we were forced to meet outside in the rain and snow for our services. The largest church in Europe had become homeless. At the beginning of the crisis, I had done what I always did. I went to God. He had never failed me, and I knew he would have our solution. I wasn't the least bit worried, but as I prayed, I received no answer. 
God seemed silent. I prayed for months, then for a full year, as the tractors moved in and our lease expired and the building's owners shut off the plumbing. Our people began to wonder where we would go. Still, God gave me no guidance on the subject. His silence shook me more than anything. I could handle government oppression. I had been dealing with that since I had come to the Soviet Union in the 1980s. I could handle crisis involving our church location. We had moved often, changing locations half a dozen times in one five-year period. We had bounced all around the city and still had grown. Man-made problems didn't alarm me, but the silence of God did. Where was my ever-present help? What had I done wrong? Finally, his reply came during a time of intense prayer. Stand up to the city government. Don't let them shove you around anymore. His answer challenged me to my core. I was so unprepared to accept it that I cleared my schedule and took another week in prayer to make sure I had heard correctly. I prayed all day for seven days, and God's message to me did not change. He was preparing us to have a bigger impact than I had anticipated. We just had to learn to listen. People Power God told me to take our church to the streets of Kiev in protest. The people are the power, he said. Use the power you have. Such a move was unprecedented in Ukraine, but God opened my eyes to see that to complete the Great Commission, we must have impact upon nations, not just people in churches. Transforming nations requires bold steps. We could no longer be concerned with just preserving what we had or adding numbers to our congregation. We were being called to move strongly into every sphere of society. That included using methods we had never considered, like public protest. My views on civil disobedience were traditional and conservative. I believed Christians were never to disobey or demonstrate against the government, but rather to humbly submit to it because it bears God's authority and power to punish. I was not afraid of the punishment, but I certainly wanted to obey God, and so I taught myself and my people to honor the government and comply with its laws. But in that place of prayer, alone and broken, God showed me I was wrong. He took me through the book of Acts and showed me that civil disobedience can be righteous when you are fighting unrighteousness. He showed me how the disciples had disobeyed the law when the law prohibited them from preaching in the name of Jesus. See Acts chapter 5. I had never seen that as civil disobedience before, but now I did. Not only did they disobey the law, but also God backed them up in it. In our situation, even though peaceful demonstrations were allowed by law, we still needed special permission from the government to conduct such a protest. Those special permissions were never issued. I left that time of prayer sure of what I needed to do. God's message rang in my ears. The people are the power. Use the people. I announced to our church leaders what we had to do, and many of them rejected it out of hand. That's suicide, said one. It's unbiblical, said a few others. I had already girded myself, knowing I would have to do battle with my friends before fighting the real battle in the streets of Kiev. Then I told the church what I believed God wanted us to do. Letters of resignation arrived on my desk almost immediately. We have families and businesses, people wrote. We are afraid. We don't want the government to clamp down on us like in communist times. I tried to restore unity. I told the church leadership to take a week off and seek God for an answer. These 12 men did that, and they came back with a confirmation of what God had told me. They were as astonished as I had been. And now they too were preparing for the battle to come. God was about to teach us one of the most important lessons to influence a nation, which is, you will never accomplish it if you remain within the four walls of the church. Through it all, we were discovering what the Great Commission really means. God had been teaching us that our mission as believers is to save nations, not just evangelize individuals and build churches. God is not terribly concerned with church size and church ministries. These are all sidelights to his main goal, which is for all nations to walk after him in kingdom principles. The church fulfills its mandate when it changes society, 
not when it's confined to its sanctuary and Sunday school classrooms. The church is to build the kingdom of God in a nation. The kingdom must overflow into streets and workplaces, governments and entertainment venues. That is its nature, to grow and take over. If you try to keep it yourself, you lose it. And we didn't want to lose it. Church-focused churches. Too many Christians and Christian leaders spend their energy, creativity, and precious time promoting churches instead of the kingdom. They work for the success of their church, or perhaps for a group of churches in their city, or they work for their ministry or denomination. They believe that by building churches and ministries, they are building the kingdom. They think church and kingdom are practically synonymous. This isolation of the church from the world has led to ineffectiveness and failure to carry out the Great Commission. But the church is not the kingdom. Jesus said in Luke 17, 21, Nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. It's not confined to temples and churches. No church can contain or control the kingdom of God. The kingdom is meant to inhabit the entire earth not just your church sanctuary. The Great Commission is not what many of us have understood it to be. We have understood it to be evangelism, bringing people from the world into our church buildings. But the Great Commission mandate is to go out and disciple nations. The focus is not in here, but out there. This was Jesus' goal in coming to earth. It is supposed to be our goal as redeemed people. The Great Commission in Matthew 28:19 says, Go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus did not say, Go and build great churches. He did not even say, Go and save individuals. He never said, May thy church come on earth as it is in heaven. Neither did he say, Seek ye first the church in all its righteousness. Rather, his heartbeat is for nations to be ruled by kingdom principles. That is the calling of every believer and of every church. So why has our attention been lavished on personal evangelism and building churches? The problem is our mindset. We often forget that the kingdom has come. We forget we have been called to rule our promised lands and to rule nations. We forget about the power we receive from Jesus Christ. So our attention is drawn to churches. Building a church seems much more manageable than transforming a nation. My own religious background taught me that the kingdom of God was all about heaven, not earth. I thought kingdom work took place after we die, once we had passed over into the kingdom. I misread the Bible and the words of Jesus. I made the kingdom of God all about the future, and so my focus and purpose in life were off course. I was having little impact on the world around me. But because God wanted to do something in Ukraine that was much bigger than our big church, or me, he graciously taught us to take a proactive position in society, to go outside our building and enforce his authority over an ungodly nation and government. Today, many people sit in church pews hoping to make it to the kingdom of God, and they don't realize that, according to Jesus, the kingdom is here and now. Nobody has to die to see the kingdom. We are as close as we will ever get. Jesus didn't leave the kingdom of God in heaven when he came to earth. He brought it with him. The born-again believer is in the kingdom at this moment. We can stop hoping for it. It came 2,000 years ago, and it is present with us now. When we forget that the kingdom is here and now, we shrink from our calling to disciple nations. We want to use the church as our escape hatch from the world's problems. The battle is certainly fierce, but God is sending Christians not to hide out in or even build churches, but to have impact in their lives and on the nations of the world. If you are trying only to build a church, your goal is wrong. The promise of God is, quote, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, end quote. Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. Imagine that. We are meant to inherit nations. We are responsible not for sanctuaries and Sunday school rooms, but for our nations. We are not separate from our nations in God's sight. We belong to nations. God will hold us responsible for nations. We cannot flee into the church and think our hands will be washed clean of all that happens outside. We are called to the world to restore the kingdom, 
And if there is any nation that is suffering under a godless culture, it's because Christians have not subdued it with kingdom principles. God did not answer our church's many prayers to resolve our problem of having a place of worship because he had something bigger in mind, the salvation of the nation, not just providing a new place for us to gather. Some people believe that if they work in the nursery or sing in the choir, they are fulfilling their area of ministry. But this is not really ministry. It is merely housekeeping. Your work as a choir member, nursery volunteer, or usher is what we all must do to keep the church functioning, but it is not necessarily fulfilling the Great Commission. The Great Commission happens outside the church. Ministry is what you do to bring your life and your sphere of influence under kingdom rule. The Kingdom-Driven Church Church has never been the focus of the Great Commission, but it has always been the most important tool for carrying out the Great Commission. The church is the primary vehicle God uses to train people so they know how to find their promised land and rule in their nation. Church is the headquarters, but battles are not fought at headquarters. They are fought in the field. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 calls the church the pillar and foundation of the truth. It upholds the kingdom by being the school, the equipping place, and the place of support for world changers. But our focus must remain outside, not inside. We are to go from the school into the world and bring the powerful kingdom principles to bear on its problems. When Christians change the goal of the church and make it a place of conservation and escape rather than equipping and sending, we are working against the Great Commission. We are conserving crowds, not sending them out. We are hoarding kingdom resources, namely people and their gifts. In many churches, God's workers are in captivity. They are like prisoners and the pastors are the wardens. We are not called to huddle inside the church sanctuary, but to restore the kingdom of God to the world. But some Christians and preachers misinterpret the word ekklesia, the Greek word for church, which means literally called out ones. They mistakenly believe it means we are to be called away from the world. This is a grave error. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 15, quote, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. End quote. As a church, we are called out from the evil principles of this world, but we are still required to live here. We are not built for monasteries. Our calling is to operate from a different and superior set of principles than the world we live in. The church is to train us to be Christ-like, to embody Jesus and his principles, so that in everyday life we may operate from a godly perspective. That's what the church is for. That's why we come on Sunday. That's why we preach, teach, and worship together. God holds the church responsible for societies. It is the most potent organization in the world because it was started by Jesus and his bride. No other entity in the world is as important as the church in spite of all its failures. It is the hope of God because through it and only it the kingdom can come. But the church is only relevant on earth. It is irrelevant in heaven. When the church gets to heaven, it will become one with Christ. So the task of the church is here and now to bring the kingdom to earth. Churches come and go, but the kingdom is everlasting. Our focus must be on the kingdom and on redeeming nations. The church is to be the training ground for people who will impact the society around them. As I and the people in my church began to grasp our kingdom calling, our fear melted away. We decided to take the massive risk and march on City Hall, even in the face of danger. The people are the power, God had told me. It was time to take that power to the streets. Little did we know that this act of obedience to a divine instruction from heaven, though unconventional, would go a long way to shaping the history of our nation. As we obeyed, we learned impacting principles that we had never discovered before. I will share them with you now. It's what I call church shift. Kingdom principles from chapter 1. Number 1. The church fulfills its mandate when it changes society, not when it is confined to its sanctuary and Sunday school classrooms. Number 2. 
This isolation of the church from the world has led to ineffectiveness and failure to carry out the Great Commission. Number three, the Great Commission mandate is to go out and disciple nations. Number four, ministry is what you do to bring your life and your sphere of influence under kingdom rule. Number five, we are not called to huddle inside the church sanctuary, but to restore the kingdom of God to the world. Number six, God holds the church responsible for societies. The church is to be the training ground for people who will impact the society around them.